uh, last couple of weeks about the concept of Dwapar Yuga. And I had thought that last week, perhaps that was, I had said enough on it, but I realized there was a couple of things missing and I wanted to continue this discussion a little bit. One is I did not give people, you, a chance to properly ask questions that maybe you had uh, in mind. And I think I mentioned last week that I'd be answering those questions uh, today. And so if you do have questions, you can write them in the question box or the chat box, and maybe we'll do it uh, audio as well. And, but the second reason is I began to ponder. And when I first read the autobiography of a yogi and encountered a little bit this mention of Swami Sri Teshvar, his uh, concept of the yugas, I found it fascinating. And I, I read what he had to say in the holy science. And I found that it struck me. Uh, and for some reason, it it had an impact upon me that I was not quite able to, you might say, conceptualize why it had such an impact on me. But I, I realized that it it was something in my mind that I kept coming back to again and again. And finally, I began to think, why is this, you know, why does this sem seemingly uh, abstruse idea what is, why is, why am I so attracted to it? And I had heard about the yugas. I knew about the traditional uh, concept of the yugas that's common in India with most people. And, but the yugas saying that we're in Kali Yuga, but the timelines of those were so vast that it was pretty much irrelevant to my day-to-day -day experience of life or my understanding of life of understanding of history, where we might go. And if if Kali Yuga really is hundreds of thousands of years, what difference would it make what I do or not do or what happens in the world today? But I began to, when uh, Sri Teshwar in his uh, short exposition on the Yugas and the Holy Science mentioned that the Yuga of Kali was much shorter than that, and that it was something that was in a reasonable amount of time to grasp. Uh, Kali Yuga, in his case, being a thousand years plus the Sundays on the preceding it and following it, <laughs> <coughs> that seemed like something that was much more graspable in my mind. And I began to think about it, and and thinking about Kali, looking back, yes, we have been historically, it's traditionally, we even say the time, you know, some thousand years ago, 1500 years ago was a dark age. And yes, it, it seems pretty dark. And so it began to arrange my thinking, but it had a an impact in that it affected me that in the sense that if we are in an ascending yuga, then it gave me a sense of hopefulness, you might say. There's a purposeful direction of world events. I try to keep up, uh, not obsessively, but I read the newspapers or now look at the internet and see what's happening. I try not to devote too much time to it unnecessarily, but just to be aware of things. And it can be a little bit uh, discouraging. And you think, and I know growing up, there was all the, always this thought that older people would always say, oh, back in the good old days, and they would be grumpy about, oh, life is going downhill, everything's terrible. And I was not in tune with that, let's say. I tend to have a little bit more positive frame of mind. But then, of course, I began to introspect, is that just wishful thinking? And when I read the about the yugas, what Master said, Sri Teshvarji said about the sense we're moving in a higher age, it confirmed my own intuitive view of world events, not just because living standards worldwide were going up and so on, because we can see counterpoints to that in terms of chaos also, life does seem to be somewhat chaotic, but nevertheless, that there's a sense of direction inwardly for myself, 
personally, but also outwardly, there seems to be uh, an evolving sense of direction that, uh, and then more importantly, I think the concept of the yugas as something that is can be generally shared, it reminded me that as Paramahansa Yogananda says in his autobiography that Babaji, the great ones, the avatars, they come again and again into this world to guide the world, to guide us as individuals to a purposeful direction toward self-realization. And that they're not coming just for me alone, but they're coming for society as a whole, that we might as a society, as a world society, that we might move in a purposeful direction. And that if that is so, then each one of us play some small part in that process. So in a sense, it, it reminds me that I have a role to play. I have, I, my actions uh, are purposeful. There's a philosophical outlook, nihilism, the sense of, uh, of meaninglessness, you might say, that's current in the world today that's discouraging. And to think that people would buy into that sense of discouragement, but I could I could understand why some people might see that. But it's a you might say the idea of yugas are a counterpoint to a nihilistic worldview. And that each of us need to participate in countering that nihilistic worldview for the betterment of society as a whole. Now, some people say, well, what's it matter what we do? It's all about what we do individually within ourselves and society has, we can let it go, go to the mountains, go to the cave, retreat, get away from it all. And that has been a world view of many over the last millennia or two millennia. But it seems to me that we are in an age where that isn't going to serve me personally in terms of my spiritual growth. We need to think in terms of something larger than my own spiritual advancement. And the way, and as a sense, we have a role to play in life as a whole. And thinking in terms of the yugas, and I'm very attracted, my personal attraction to scripture of the Bhagavad Gita, you, see, you could say that the Gita was written in a descending age of Dwapara, and that as we are, if, as Sri Yukteswarji says, we're in an ascending age of Dwapara, it makes relevant to me why the Bhagavad Gita is such an important scripture for us to study to attune ourselves with. Because what is Krishna saying? He's not saying to retreat to the mountain caves. He's saying act in this world. Action is appropriate in this world, but right action, dharmic action, non-attached action, sacrificial action, sacrifice, sacrifice of the individual soul. So, so in the sense of because I, it, you know, I look to the Gita as scripture, it, can, it makes sense to me. And I begin to understand what's why Paramahansa Yogananda came at the direction of Babaji into the world as an avatar. And he was, Babaji had told Yogananda that one of your missions is to show the underlying harmony of the great scriptures of the world, particularly as examples of that, the Bhagavad Gita, the original teachings of Krishna through the Bhagavad Gita, the original teachings of Jesus Christ through the uh, Bible. And since uh, now you might think, well, I grew up in the West, uh, America, uh, but I was an oddball because I, I tend to, I, look up toward the Bhagavad Gita, and I somewhat dismiss the Bible in my uh, scriptural training as I grew up. But knowing, seeing that, 
uh, or hearing that admonition that Babaji had given to Paramahansa Yogananda, it made me take note, well, I need to understand what the original Christianity is also. And so consequently, it through the study of the yugas, that concept, maybe this there is something to this, that we're in ascending age and that we are at a particular time. Uh, it gave coherence to that. Now, a did uh, addendum to that, of course, is it made the understanding of the yugas also gave clarity to the appearance of our guru, my guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, why he came at this time, why all of our masters came of our this path came at this time, and what their mission is, and to understand that it's not random. They came at a special time with a special mission. And as part of that special mission, Kriya Yoga was relevant to that. Why? Because Kriya Yoga, of course, is working with energy and energy being a component of this age in which we find ourselves Basically, I began to understand, ah, this is what's happening here. This is what's going on. And so consequently, I began to integrate, and perhaps it might apply to you as well, Kriya, the appearance of the incarnation of these great avatars, why they have come into this age, and how, of course, I fit into that as a disciple who wants to share that with others. And so in, in understanding that this is a world historical event, you might say this unfoldment, as it says in the, in the autobiography of Yogi, that Babaji is guiding this unfoldment events in this age, spiritual unfoldment in this age. Now, if that is true, you can say in some sense, I can relax. There is meaning, there is purpose. And when you look at world events and you see chaos, you say, yes, there's just as the yugas themselves are a rhythm. So you see the day-to-day -day events in the short term, they have their own rhythm of up and down. And in the sense, it allows one to take a step back and just see things in a larger perspective. Now, this is an important, I think, perspective to have just generally. It's not to take things too personally, to be impersonal a little bit, you know, especially about oneself. But I think in the sense that when, if one gets too involved in the day-to-day -day turmoil of worrying about these things uh, and saying, yes, we have to deal with them, but we don't have to fret, you might say, about them, other than the fact that perhaps it motivates us to do something to make, make uh, things better. better. But, it, but it helps us weather. Um, and we see our own spiritual evolution in, in these terms, that we're, we're all passing through a phase. Uh, yeah, and, and the other part is, you know, because I am tasked with sharing master's teachings, it kind of, I think it makes me a little bit, seeing them in terms of the yugas makes me a little bit more forgiving of the folly that all of us find ourselves in in this age. Because what are we in? We're in the age of Dwapar ascending at the very beginning. And as Sri Yukteswar, you know, 125 years ago or whatever it was, defined it. It's an age of self-interest, an age of ego. Well, okay, but it's not always going to be that way. And so consequently, it says, yes, we too are going through, a, this society is going through a phase, world is going through a phase, and it'll change. And if I then look in the mirror and look at myself, well, yes, I'm self-interested, uh, but this is a phase and I'm moving from self-interestedness to an enlightened self-interest. I hope I've made some progress, 
And I see it in terms of life, in terms of directionality. And I think this is something that's a message for all of us. Life is directional. We, we can't judge ourselves. Well, here I, perfection is there. I'm less than perfect. Therefore, something wrong with me. And I haven't, I have, you know, it's either or as we've spoken about in other classes, whereas we say that, yes, but I'm aspiring to that and I'm moving to that. And so consequently, I can relax a little bit about my own self-judgment. And also, I think more, more helpfully, my judgment of other people, my judgment of society, and uh, just generally take a more long rhythm view of my own life, and also society is itself, because I think in a sense, if you if you put that coin right up to your eye, all you see is that coin. And so if we see, put our own ego up next to our own faults, our own personalities, our own uh, quirks, uh, we don't get a good perspective. Now, another point, perspective, it, it reminds me of is that we're in a, in this age now, but we're infected by view of where we're going in the future by our, uh, you might say by the past. We're infected by our, our view of the past from the age from which we're coming. It's inevitable that we have to see things through the lens of our own past experience. And so society itself looks to the future through the lens of the past. Mod we look at the future through the lens of modernity, mod modernity, modernism. Uh, and so consequently, what do we see? We see things mechanistically. And I remember Swami Kriyananda making an interesting point some years ago. Uh, I think it was in the 1980s when that movie, uh, movies in the plural star wars was released and so it was very popular people went to see that movie again and again and says so a group of people took swami to it and swami said well he was a fun movie you know so swami saw everybody else was having fun watching it so he didn't want to be a, a damp a damp blanket on anybody's enthusiasm but he said the one thing he had reservations about he says why is it that when we look to the future and we, you know, now, of course, in the that Star Wars movie, they were saying all that happened a long time in the past at a time long, long time ago. But nevertheless, when you, if you read science fiction and those sorts of things, they're looking toward the future, space travel, uh, 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 rocket ships, uh, future robotics and future cities. It's always there's a certain mechanistic and a perfection of technology. It's seen through the lens of technology, a more modern technology, a better way of, of slicing the apple or, or what. And he says, why is that? He says, is that really a true way to look at the future? People think Swami uh, Sri Yukteswar says the essence of up the yugas, the advancement of the essence is an increase in awareness, consciousness, let's say, or dharma also. It's an increase in awareness. Now, does increase in awareness necessarily correlate with more sophisticated, complex, slick technology? We seem to think it's so. But does it necessarily have to be so? And I think one of the reasons we think that way is because we think mechanistically, which is a way of a Kali Yuga way of looking at life through things, through materialism. But might not, as we move into a higher age, there be even less, I'm not saying less technology so much, but might it be not technology bound, might not there be a greater attunement in the future with natural forces, forces that are potentials within us right now, 
might not, you could say technology seems to be at odds with nature, with the environment. Might not we be moving into an age when we're going to live more instead of conquering nature, we're moving into an age where we begin to harmonize with nature. And so consequently, might we be moving instead of a world of greater and greater complexity into an age of greater and greater simplicity, but simplicity not in the sense of being primitive. Now, what might that be? I don't know, but, I, it, but it sparks my imagination. And can you, would we say that to live in Satya Yuga, we're going to live in this uh, <laughs> highly sophisticated technological age? Or might we live in, a, in an age where it's simple, but it's mind power, you see, it's yogic power to control the energy within ourselves directly, rather than what we do now is we can, which we're learning into our prayer to control energy, but we're controlling that energy indirectly from outside of ourselves. Now, this is exactly what Kriya Yoga is all about, learning to control our life force and learning to uplift our life force directly, not indirectly, which is through indirect means would be to remind you, would be through ceremony, through rituals, to doing something outside of ourselves that makes us feel inspired. But how do we learn to control our inspiration directly from within ourselves through our life force? And then how, and this is, of course, is what the essence is of spirituality in Dwapara Yuga. And this is the essence of uh, awakening, you could say, through the, through the practice of spirituality, of practicing these techniques. Now, one thing in this theme uh, that Sri Tashwar said, he says, now, and I can't, I can't reconcile this quite uh, uh, fully yet. Uh, Sri Yukteswar said that the full awakening of awareness in, of, of Dwapara Yuga implies an awakening of consciousness of the, of the mass, the general consciousness of society in this solar system is an awakening to the astral universe within us. And that's the ability for now, if we take that to the individual, that would mean our ability to withdraw that life force, to raise it up and to be baptized in the holy sound of Om, to be able to transcend this buloka and uh, this plane of materialism in which we live into that astral plane of Uvar Loka, be, a, be aware of our consciousness to transcend from Buloka to Buvar Loka by merging ourselves into the holy stream of home. Now, if that's a definition, as what Sri Yukteswar does in the last, toward the end of the holy science, say, oh, that's remarkable. And then I think, well, is that even, is that possible? Yeah, well, Shri Deshwar said it could be, because I guess in against, we personalize it. We personalize as well. I look at about me and I see this society in 2000 years, will this society advance to that point? Something to remember. The souls that are here now in this age that we're in right now on this planet are here because their consciousness is attuned to the vibration that is prevalent in this solar system right now. Those souls may not fit in this earthly plane, this solar system in 2000 years. So there's no guarantee they're coming back. There's no guarantee you or I are coming back to this plane. And as this is conforms to what master said, he says, uh, when he was asked, do you know, do we always come back here? Swamiji asked Master that. And his master said, No, we don't. 
we there's many places in this universe where we go we go to that solar system or planetary system or that material world where or galaxy perhaps even where we are in tune with that level of consciousness and we happen to be here right now in this day and age because we are in tune with what's going on right here right now beforehand we could have been somewhere very different in the future we may be somewhere very different so but the consciousness of this planet is an ascension and who knows maybe in 2000 years those inhabitants of this planet will be able to uh, move from Buloka to Bubarloka uh, as a general rule. Maybe, I, you know, I kind of think, well, that, you know, maybe I could be in there if I, if, uh, if I was to raise myself to that level of consciousness to be able to easily transcend those two states. Something to think about. It's possible, of course, for all of us to do that right now in this lifetime. And that's why we've been given the technique of Kriya. So for all of these reasons, I find it, an ex, it a very inspirational topic to explore because it inspires me. It gives me comfort and it allows me to share these teachings in context with uh, uh, a, a, sort of, you might say a larger context. And so, I'm going to, I see, I'm going to uh, <laughs> open it up to some chat here, if there is chat. Uh, uh, well, I didn't get any chat here. So I'm going to, if, if some of you would like to share verbally, I'm going to look at my gallery view here. And oh, it doesn't let me see gallery view. Well, hmm, what do I do? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's because we're in a webinar, so you cannot see the gallery view. Oh, I can't do that because we're in a webinar. Okay, I understand. Well, uh, if somebody would, can we open it up to other people asking questions? Yes, yeah, certainly. So if you have a question and you want to ask it verbally, you can raise your hand in Zoom and we oh, will ask you to unmute. Else, you can put it in the chat or in the Q&A section, but it may take a few minutes for people to type. But then how do I see people? I don't maybe, huh? You can see the participants tab and then you go to attendees and then you will see who are there. Okay, well, okay, attendee view, okay. Okay, well, if we don't have any questions and answers, I think we're going to we're going to move on to a next our next topic. And so it will come back next week. So I hope, You've enjoyed our, our discourse, three-session three, three session discourse on Dwapara Yuga. And let's attune ourselves to this age, let's, which is an age of energy. It's, so consequently, what we've been given, you could say we've incarnated a time where energy is the, is the essence of the spiritual path, awakening that energy and using that energy and the particular methods that have been given to us is this technique of Kriya Yoga. So let us practice together and use what the masters have given us. And then who knows, we'll be able to raise that energy up and fulfill what uh, you could say the potential that has been given to each of us, which is to merge ourselves into, and to baptize ourselves into that holy stream of Om. God bless all of you, and I look forward to seeing you. We'll move on to another topic next week. Joy to you.